Good afternoon. Welcome to my time-lapse video of the engine install day. I had a few friends kindly join me for, for this um, engine fit. So we've got uh, Jake, Jamie and Kyle all came to help. And as you can see, we uh, made a start bright and early on a Sunday morning with uh, myself and Jake working in the bottom left uh, to prepare the engine for the install. I hope to have this done um, before these guys arrived, but other things got in the way. So we just needed to take the starter motor off, take the bell housing adapter off, remount the bell housing adapter to the gearbox, mount the gearbox to the engine, and then refit the starter motor. Easy, right? In the meantime, Kyle and Jamie were working on protecting the inside of the Caterham engine bay. So cutting out some cardboard, and taping it to the delicate heat shielding areas, uh, and just prepping the car really to make sure that when we swing in a, a large engine around, that there's, uh, we're going to minimise how much damage we do if we lose control of it. Things started going a little bit wrong right from the start in that the, um, the starter motor had a quite an inaccessible bolt. It was one of those really frustrating bolts that you can see it and it, and it kind of looks easy to get to, but the combination of tools we were using just weren't doing a good enough job to either take it out nor, nor put it back in. Um, we ended up getting it off eventually, obviously, to get the gearbox uh, installed, but getting it back on and getting the bolt back into the right torque spec just took ages, um, messing around with lots of adapters, um, UJs, extenders, wobble bars, whatever we had access to, to try and to try and get this bolt in. Um, but, you know, we, we got there eventually, and as you can see, Jake's now going around talking up the rest of the gearbox bolts. Uh, while Jamie wraps up the, the main body of the gearbox just with the polyurethane um, sheeting that it came with. Again, just to add a bit of protection um, to both the car and the gearbox as we're, as we're sliding it in. Around this time, disaster struck. Um, I finally got the, the bolt in the starter motor talked up. And then, because we're using so many adapters cobbled together, um, it all kind of fell apart. And the little hex bit, for the bolt dropped down somewhere and we just could not find it anywhere what was worrying was there is an aperture into the bell housing so we were convinced that it had vanished inside the inside the bell housing behind the flywheel somewhere which meant that the whole thing had to come off again so we got we got started um again trying to get this difficult bolt out around this time jake had been kind of poking around through my tools and he presented a um, selection of really stumpy low profile hex bits which are perfect for this job and once we used those we managed to get the um, the bolt out and in really quickly which was quite annoying anyway long story short um, we got the starter off again and the little hex bit just fell out onto the floor it was sat on top of the starter motor the whole time so with the starter motor back in, it was now time to, as you can see, get the engine um, hoisted up and start approaching the engine bay with it. Um, it was actually quite straightforward, this, you know, having a few hands available and, and mainly, pr primarily, many sets of eyes is the main thing. You need people checking for clearances on the bottom, on the top, on the side. Um, and once you've got that that visibility, um, it, it really is a, a doddle to, to shuffle the engine into place. Um, I criticised the engine crane on a previous video because it just came with mismatched nuts and bolts. Um, I started appreciating the engine crane a bit more now. It had a really smooth granular control to lower it. Engine cranes I've borrowed and used in the past are very clunky and they drop heavyweights quite quickly and aggressively. This one was brilliant, really manoeuvrable. Uh, and as you can see, we're just gradually, slowly shuffling the engine in. Um, the level of bar, I would say, is close to mandatory because um, that allows you to alter the pitch of the engine as it's going in um, and really start sliding into the transmission tunnel. Around the point we're at now, it's dawned on us that the engine is slightly rotated off its um, Z-axis, would that be? Yeah, I think so. Um, Z-axis. So we're just having a chat about that and the best way to, to move it around. Um and constantly going back and sort of offering up the engine mounts to the engine to see how far we are we are off that they seem to be a really good reference point to use um to give us an idea 
the clearance in the transmission tunnel, which of course you can't see from this angle, is just so impossibly tight. Um, it just makes moving the engine around quite difficult at this point. So it's really small adjustments. Uh, I'm at this point just lifting on the inlet manifold to try and give it the rotation we think it needs. We think the exhaust side of the engine needs to go down. And now, as you can see, we're threading in a ratchet strap to help with that process, just to tilt the engine, which gets us a lot closer at this point. Lots more um, thinking and conversation and planning. Uh, and what we're now doing is we're looking at the um, getting the engine bolts roughly and loosely bolted up, just in case we lose clearance later, uh, where it becomes apparent that we've got some imperial um, cap head bolts to, to deal with. And of course, I don't have any imperial sockets for those. So we have to cobble something together lately, uh, later in the process to, to get on top of that. Um, but yeah, as you can see, lots of conversation going on and, and seemingly not much, not much action. So around this time, I'm rolling around under the car, spending some time under the catering for the first time properly. Uh, just checking the line on the engine mounts um, while the guys are shuffling things around. Um, and it's getting close to lunchtime at this point. So one of the ways I was able to encourage the guys to come and spend the day with me was to, by making them some lunch. So I vanished off to um, get the various prep stuff done for that. Kind of sticking my head in every few minutes just to ask if it was done yet. Um, what the guys are looking for at this point is something that can replace the imperial bit that we need. Um, the cap head sockets for the um, bolts for the engine mounts were a little bit too big for a 10 mil hex. Um, so they're just rooting through all of my stuff. I think Jamie had the brainwave in the end. He found I had some punches and the punch handles were roughly the right size and shape. So that allowed us to at least get them wound in a little bit um, to check alignment and then they'll be talked up later once I get the the proper tools. And at around this point we break for lunch which was for the cheese steak sandwiches. Okay, so uh, coming back after lunch, and we, I seem to recall we spent quite a lot of time just talking about race car things at this point, um, trying to get motivated again for more, for more activity. Uh, we still had a slight, a slight issue with the, the gearbox alignment. Um, it wasn't quite lining up with the gearbox cradle mount that goes you know, inside the, the transmission tunnel. So we got to work, we moved the engine crane around, as you can see, and we used that for a little bit of manipulation on the gearbox end. And it, it really wasn't, it, it wasn't too difficult um, to get it in place with some help from, from Imogen there, coming in and checking we were, we were doing okay. And we just ended up rotating the box around a little bit. I seem to recall uh, taking a pry bar under the car at one point, just to get a little bit more leverage on the gearbox. Um, and once we got it lined up roughly with the with the cradle mount, the um, tightening up and talking up the cradle bolts did the rest of the job to get the engine twisted into place. At, what, at that point, the engine mounts could be tightened up and talked up, which is what, what Jamie's laying on the floor there, helping me get done. Um, we had a, the manual at this point calls for many, many, many pages of, of engine plumbing. Um, but if you skip ahead 20 or so pages, you get to the installation of the prop shaft and the differential, which I wanted to get done because while I had more hands available, it, it made sense to, to look at the diff because it's quite heavy, a heavy component. But what we decided is because there was enough of us, Jake could crack on with the plumbing regardless and follow the manual sequentially. So you'll see Jake doing a lot of work around the front of the car with the plumbing hoses and, um, Kyle, Jamie and myself spent time figuring out what was on the critical path to getting the prop shaft in. So I think around this time we had to say goodbye to Kyle. He had some family commitments to get on with, so thank you very much. Um, he did put in a good stint. I think he was at the 
in the garage for a good five, six hours. So not that much of a part-timer. With Kyle gone, though, we needed to push on with the, as I said before, the critical path to getting the prop shaft in, which we decided was get to get the handbrake in and get the handbrake cable in. I think connecting those after the prop shaft would have been quite difficult. So while Jake cracks on with plumbing, um, Jamie and I are stalling for time a little bit by plugging a few engine loom connectors in because it looked easy uh, before we start doing one of the, I find one of the most tedious tasks of building a Caterham so far, which is going through a load of randomly packed boxes, trying to find parts that you need. So you can see Jamie here spending a lot of time going through boxes and through my cabinets. The part that was eluding us was a, was the pulley wheel for the handbrake cable. Um, we did find it eventually, but and it was one of those things where it's kind of hard to describe, but it was just way smaller than we expected. So the hunt still goes on for the handbrake pulley thing. I start collecting out the other fixings that I need to install the handbrake, uh, which is just a few bolts and um, little clevis pins um, for the pulley when we eventually when it eventually turned up. And I get bolting in the handbrake um, in the car. Dead easy job, just quite tight on access, so you can't get any ratcheting spanners in there or any socket wrenches in there or whatever. So pretty slow going, the old fashioned way. Um, and Jamie, as you can see, is starting to route the cable, even without the pulley at this point. Um, we figured we could at least route the cable um, to potentially add the pulley later on. Um, routing the cable is dead easy, really, but there is a, a slight gotcha that we, we tripped over later on when the diff was added. But I think at this point, I'll probably do a dedicated video for the diff install because, well, A, at time of doing this commentary, I've not actually installed the diff yet, um, and B, it's the job that gets talked about a lot as being a difficult one or a challenging one or whatever. So it probably is probably worthy of a better camera angle um, showing what's actually going on behind the car when we get to that point. Around about now, I believe the the pulley was um, was located um, and Jamie's just helping from the top while I'm underneath the car to get the clevis pins lined up and, and dropped into the uh, dropped into the relevant places. The prop shaft is now out of the box and you see Imogen walking around with the protective sleeving for it. She had lots of fun with that. Um, and this is where um, Jamie and I are just planning the last bit of the routing um, for the prop shaft. It's pretty straightforward, it's pretty obvious. It goes in from the back. The chassis does get very tight though, um, and the kind of side body panels for the transmission tunnel, um, the universal joint on the on the prop shaft really does come up tight in there. Uh, I'll be honest, we had to get a little bit rough with the rubber mallet to eventually pop that in place. But once we got it roughly lined up, it um, it just slides straight into the gearbox once you line the line the splines up. There's a good old bit of ambiguity on the install manual. There's a bleed nipple on the prop shaft and the manual says something along the lines of grease if required with no indication other than a little dribble of grease coming out of the nipple to just suggest that it was pre-greased from the factory. But I don't know, I might try hooking my grease gun up to it at some point in the future and just try adding a little bit more um, just to be sure. So, so at this point, the light's starting to fade outside, as you can see. Um, and Jamie and I are um, having a look at just offering up the diff to where it needs to mount so we can start planning out what that looks like. Um, we don't go much further with it. Um, we came away um, with a few things to think about, which again, I'll cover off in a different video with, with better camera angle. Uh, meanwhile, Jake is into hour nine of engine bay plumbing. Um, but... Jake has to leave us any minute now, so we all get emotional. Um, Jake gives us a handover of what he's done so far, what he hasn't done, what he skipped, what he's talked, what he hasn't, etc. Um, and then we call it a night. So thank you again to Kyle, Jamie, and uh, Jake for helping out all day. It's a really good, good, uh, good shift. Got loads of work done, and it was good fun as well. I think everybody, everybody showed up. Not hopefully not because they feel sorry for me, but because they're interested in cars and spannering on cars. And hopefully they enjoyed the process a little bit, at least once we got that start amount, start a motor bolt out. Um, 
that was a pain. So yeah, thanks for watching. I will um, continue with the shorter format videos going forward and we'll pick up with the diff in a couple of days.